Hello and welcome to another Ask Lattice. Two things I want to uh, just go through or tell you about before we get going with the questions today. One is that you may hear a little bit of noise in the background, um, so uh, drilling through walls or chopping up wood. And this is because we actually have something really exciting going on at the moment that we're expanding the facility that we have here and building out a performance center for testing and working with athletes. Um, so that's going on and we'll kind of share that and show you a, around that um, in due course. But um, just so you know, there's a noise in the background, that's what's happening. Um, and then secondly is to also tell you about a new service that we've just brought out, which is called Lattice 365. And this is something that we spent a while developing now and we wanted to create a way to support you in your training and performance that was the kind of most cost effective and best value um, in terms of a subscription that you would pay to access the resources and the knowledge at Lattice. So what we've done is we've set up Lattice 365. You can find loads about it on the website if you want to look at this more. But in a nutshell, is it's a private Facebook group which contains our coaches, our nutritionist, and a private physio. You have access to those people all the way through the year. You can ask questions just like you will have asked for the Lattice, uh, Ask Lattice today, and you can get those answered at any point. So it's a really flexible um, mobile service in terms of uh, asking questions about training, your own performance, physiology, nutrition, any of those areas. And built in with it also is access to all of our paid webinars. So you don't have to pay um, to subscribe to each of those webinars one by one. You get access to the entire webinar library um, that we produce over the last few months. And that's an ongoing thing. So you'll always get access to those. We also have ongoing discounts that are exclusive just to 365 members. So for example, at the moment, we have a triple rung plus campus rung deal, which is heavily discounted just to kind of return a little bit extra value in terms of that. So just go to our website, you'll find it under Lattice365, and we do hope to see you in there very soon because it's really good service and I'm really uh, happy of what we've done with that. Yeah. So let's go on with the questions now. Um, and the questions for today, uh, we asked out to the community on Facebook and Instagram. And these are more kind of general questions. Uh, they haven't got a particular topic. Uh, so there's quite a lot of different things to go through today. And the first question that I have is around uh, measuring how fatigued you are and uh, when's good to get on with a training session. And this precise question is, when should you skip sessions? Uh, when is too tired that you wouldn't bother doing a climbing session? And the answer to this in general is that if a session requires a high degree of quality and intensity, and that can be in a mixture of physical quality intensity, mental quality intensity, and also technical quality intensity, you don't want to do those sessions when you're fatigued because essentially you won't get into the right kind of performance zone to make changes and put in a quality session so that you can adapt and get better because it's so demanding in terms of the quality and intensity of those sessions. So essentially you're kind of wasting your time by being fatigued and trying to complete those very high intensity, high quality sessions. Uh, same goes for you know power as well. Um, there's absolutely no point in doing any kind of power training session if you have a level of fatigue. Where it may still be justifiable and valid to be able to do training sessions when you have things down the further end of the spectrum in terms of uh, quality and intensity. So things like your mid-level power endurance training, your um, endurance and recovery training, flexibility work, weighted mobility work, general S and C, all of those can be completed with a level of fatigue and you will still see benefits to doing those in that manner. Um, but remember, it's gotta be a fine line that you don't tread over too often because if you spend all of your time just doing those sessions when you're fatigued, then you're gonna 
you're gonna try to find line in terms of becoming overtrained or overreaching with your training. And I typically see climbers being very enthusiastic and really keen and motivated to just do tons of volume in terms of the training and climbing they do. But on the whole, it's better to err on the side of caution and try and aim for that quality and that intensity over just hammering out more and more climbing or training. Next question is around cross training. And the person here has asked about when does cross training stop being a useful thing to do? And we've spoken about cross training quite a lot in the past and how it might be a conflict with the training that you might do. You suffer extra fatigue from doing this stuff. So we're talking about things like uh, running, cycling, mountain biking, uh, skiing, uh, yoga, swimming, any of those uh, activities which may have some crossover, some benefits in terms of general athletic health across into climbing. And I think the point at which we see cross training as being not that beneficial is one in terms of the seasonality of your, tra your training or climbing. So I think it has a lot less benefit when you're in a performance phase and you want to direct all of your time, energy and resources into actually performing. So that might be your season of three months outdoors when the conditions are the best and you've got into the best shape. I think it's really not that relevant to do any of that cross training in the background because you're just getting tired and you're using up your time as well that could be spent actually performing and achieving your goals. And in the base season, there is some relevance and some applicability. It kind of depends on how much you do in your everyday life, what your work life balance is like, um, how fit are you generally, do you need to keep your body active for your mental well-being to stay motivated. And there's no, there's no straight answer on it, but I would say that cross training I think is definitely has a lot more benefit to people who spend 40 plus hours a week sat at a desk in an office and they're only getting limited time to go on rock or get to the gym to go climbing. I think that's really useful uh, just from the sort of point of the cardiovascular stimulus. Um, and then secondly is for any climbers who are relatively new to climbing and they may not have that much general athletic conditioning and doing some kind of level of CrossFit, uh, not CrossFit, uh, cross training uh, for climbing will have a benefit for improving generalized athletic health and performance. But it's limited, it really is limited. I can't stress this enough how you are just not gonna see some transfer from running and fitness, so localized fitness in your legs to your forearms. You're just not gonna see that. I, I do plenty of running. I do not get fitter at climbing by going running. You do not go swimming and develop really fit upper body strength and fitness uh, in, on a, in a swimming pool and then see improvements on a climbing wall. It's very, very limited in terms of its transfer. The vast majority of the time you want to do something more sports specific unless you're in those scenarios we talked about where you're younger in your climbing career, you're a very, very static job and you just need it for your mental uh, well-being, motivation, health. Uh, next question is uh, completely different and that's around skin management. So the person here has asked about uh, how they manage their skin condition for climbing sessions outdoors and for training. And they really suffer with the ability to, able to maintain good skin condition all the way through the week so they can complete quality sessions. And the approach I think you need to take with this is that skin condition and getting it right takes time to build a base and you can't expect to develop good quality skin just in two or three days from having previously really wrecked it. And if you constantly maintain this cycle of having very thin skin that's highly damaged and is just about getting back on track for you to be able to climb, you won't ever get to that stage where you've got an amazing base and you can maintain that. So I think you want to take some time and you can often do this by either climbing a little bit less or climbing a lot more on wood and very, very sort of skin friendly holds um, and developing over one or two weeks a really good thick skin layer 
which you can you can you can use skincare products, so stuff like antihydral, um, rhino skin are great for developing even thicker skin. But it's just letting the skin repair, so you've got all the layers and you've hardened them up, so that then when you do your training, you've not just damaging and getting right down to the last few layers of that skin. And then secondly, on top of that, is that when you're doing your sessions, don't run your sessions all the way to the point to total skin destruction. I used to do this loads in the early years of my climbing and I just go, ah, oh, it doesn't matter, who cares? I mean, our skin will grow back. But what I've learned now as I've got um, more experience with it and I need to complete a certain amount of climbing and training as a week is that poor quality skin impacts the quality of the session so much that it's actually much more important to maintain my skin quality so that I can put in the quality sessions. So it's just about personal management and not pushing as far in those sessions to destruction. And then secondly is building up so that you have actually got a decent base to start with because you can't do anything with thin, crappy skin that you never ever let recover. You'll just be taping up constantly. Uh, next question is uh, one about pull-ups. And pull-ups are a very popular topic. Uh, we've got a number of videos on the YouTube channel which talk about pull-up methods and uh, types of pull-ups that we like using at Lattice. And the person here has asked about whether pull-ups are actually useful and two, should you do them every day? Is there a point in doing that? So first off is pull-ups are a useful exercise for climbers. We use them lots of the training that we do with our clients, but they are not the solution to everything. They won't make you a great climber on their own. You can't just solve your next leap in climbing grade by doing pull-ups. It's a tool to use in with everything else. And I wouldn't even place, you know, like 10% value on a pull-up. This is like 1% of the equation. And the pull-up is a great exercise to build up strength, strength endurance, and or endurance in the back, shoulders, and arms in a very basic, simplistic way using simple tools, which is a pull-up bar or the jugs on top of a fingerboard. And if you use that, particularly in base seasons of climbing, it's such an efficient way to train those muscles to make improvements in those areas. So who are pull-ups useful for? I've said they're a very generalized, uh, relatively non-specific exercise for climbers. And most climbers, I think, should do some form of pull-up exercise. They may do very different pull-up exercises, whether it's uh, strength endurance, strength or power exercises uh, on pull-up variations. But the people who it's most relevant to are those that really lack a certain level of strength and force generation in the shoulders, back and arms. And I'm gonna say that this is in the broadest possible sense of the people I kind of see and work with is that I think they're highly relevant for our female athletes. I think they're highly relevant for climbers who haven't yet built up a, a sport specific level amount of muscle bulk uh, in their back shoulders and arms. I think it's a very good way of uh, building up muscle mass that's relevant to climbing. And also it's really good for climbers for power based exercises who really lack power on the wall, um, particularly a little bit further down the experience end of the spectrum where they may lack the technical expertise to do power based exercises on a wall and we can do some very, very basic, simplistic power work on a pull-up bar. So that's where the types of people that I think this is relevant to. It's much more relevant, again, in the base periods of training. Um, it's not like you can't do it in peak periods, but I will put a lot more loading of pull-up work into base periods of training for climbers because of that level of specificity and it being a little bit lower. And in terms of the question of, could you do this exercise every single day of the week? I would say, in general, no. It doesn't really make sense to me why you would do it every say, day of the week. And that's because if you're gonna do some kind of form of exercise, you're trying to achieve overload. If you're trying to overload the soft tissues in the body, then you're asking for some level of adaptation to occur afterwards. Now, if we're doing an exercise every single day and overloading it every single day, 
how are we going to give ourselves time to achieve some kind of adaptation, particularly on the stuff associated with strength, because the adaptation times and the recovery are longer. You know, you can't just give yourself 12 hours rest or 24 hours rest after a hard strength session. So to me, it doesn't make sense to do a pull-up exercise every single day of the week. I think you should be blocking it into your week and doing it on, uh, let's say you, you are doing a, a, a phase where you are doing pull-up work, you might do it on a Monday, a Thursday, and a Sunday, and then cycle that around so you're doing it three times in a week. Um, you wouldn't be doing it on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or, or even Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then leaving the rest of the week. Spread that loading out across the week to allow yourself adequate rest time because we need to combine training and resting. That's what allows us to improve and make those adaptations. Okay, uh, next question is tips for older climbers. Uh, someone's asked about uh, if you're 40 plus, 50 plus as a climber, are there some general tips that you can uh, share for how to make improvements in your climbing? Uh, there's actually at least one video that we filmed in the past, which is around training for older climbers. So make sure you check those out on the channel. Um, I think it's another Ask Lattice style discussion with myself and Ollie. Um, so that breaks down as much more comprehensive in terms of how we work with older climbers. But in terms of uh, general tips for older climbers, uh, one is uh, you are gonna have a long-term battle with strength, uh, maintenance, and uh, having a level of strength that doesn't reduce over time. This is kind of like your, your battle you have to fight constantly now. So I think it's very important to include regular, consistent strength training over the years now, through your 40s and 50s and beyond. Do not have periods out of two or three years where you think, oh, well, I worked, it for, worked on strength for two years. I can come have a couple of years off from strength training. That's not the case. This needs to be a consistent thing to do now. Next up is that I think a lot of uh, the older climbers do way too much volume at a mid-level of intensity. I would much prefer those climbers to cut that work down and focus a little bit more on the quality the intensity of sessions, so around the strength work, the power work, and the application of hard technical moves on real rock, especially associated with movement economy as well. Uh, I see a lot of older climbers start to move poorly. Um, it's often associated with things like mobility as well, um, and that's really a very, very important thing for that older age group of uh, climber to work on. Um, so drop that volume in the mid intensity in particular. You, if you're watching now and you're in that age group, I know that you're all very good at that zone and you feel good at it and you'll often see very good improvements, but don't overly focus on it. Next up is rest, more rest. Because you become more endurance focused or more endurance based as you get older, then you see positive improvements in those areas. So it becomes appealing to do lots and lots and keep really active but you do need to program in rest. Your body needs increasing amounts of rest as you get older. And then coupled with that, my last point on the uh, older climber in terms of general tips is running shorter blocks of uh, mesocycles in terms of the training. So those work blocks that you do that might last two, three, four weeks, I would cut down more into the two, possibly three week zone before you take a deload or rest week. And again, I, I've spoken to so many older climbers over the years that are really hesitant to do this and they feel resistant to it because they feel like they might bored or not have anything to do or lose their gains. But this just isn't the case. You see so much more improvement by blocking things into shorter training blocks and increasing the quality, the intensity, so that your body can adapt in its own time and not have things like overtraining, injury, tweaks, niggles, or lack of motivation because you're doing too much. So really think about addressing that element. I think that's one of the biggest changes that I see a lot in that older age group when they actually tackle that and take that on board. Okay, last question. Um, and this one's also relevant to me uh, as a parent of two young children is, uh, I am a climber of a very limited time. This person has uh, children. 
they're a parent obviously and they're struggling for time to go climbing really really struggling and they've asked about would it be relevant to still do one fingerboard session a week and then do cycles of cardiovascular fitness to maintain fitness for climbing so one fingerboard session a week and then maybe go running or cycling a few times a week to maintain fitness for climbing and unfortunately the answer to this is no do not do this i really don't think this is the right approach because one single fingerboarding session a week it has a level of, you, you may, may be able to achieve some overload, you have an ability to create a stimulus for adaptation, but you've got so much time before the next session that you're very unlikely to be able to build up consequentially in terms of subsequent sessions to create overload and progression in whatever you're working, whether it's strength or strength endurance on a fingerboard. So you're just gonna constantly do this overload detrain overload detrain and you'll never go anywhere you'll just stand still and then secondly is by trying to do cardiovascular uh, exercise so running cycling swimming to maintain uh, climbing fitness is going to be really ineffective i'm afraid um, you're just not going to see a transfer from your legs um, through to your arms in climbing uh, i wish it was another way around but it's not i never advise climbers to go running or swimming to get fitter in their forearms. The transfer just doesn't occur. The fitness is very localized to the muscle that you're working. So in this case, if you're someone who's very, very stretched for time and you've got very limited resources, you need to make it as specific as possible to the activity that you're doing. So we're talking about a climbing activity and we're talking about something that's working the limiting factor in climbing, which is often the forearm. So my two choices on this, if you're in this situation, is either do your work or your time that you do have on a fingerboard or on a really small system board at home. And you can actually achieve a lot even on the most basic tiny system board at home. But that time spent on that, even if it's an hour and a half across the week, is so much better than four hours spread out on going on some random jogging or some cycling uh, or some swimming make it sports specific and you may have some chance of getting some improvements and getting somewhere that you're climbing. So I know it sounds harsh, um, but I think it's better to hear the truth and know what works. Those are all the questions for today. I uh, hope you've enjoyed uh, today's Ask Lattice. And as ever, let us know in the comments whether you like this stuff, whether you wanna know more, other topics. Don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more of this. You can click to get the notifications on YouTube and it'll tell you when we're releasing this stuff weekly. And we will see you again here very soon.